All right. Uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Obadiah. Uh, if you have trouble finding it, that's page 941 on my Bible. <laughs> Maybe a little more specific, it is uh, after Amos and before Jenna. And if that still doesn't help you, I hope you have a table of contents. <clears throat> So we're going to be looking at the entire book of Obadiah, but lucky for us, that's only 21 verses. So a little bit of background about the book of Obadiah. The book of Obadiah is written by none other than Obadiah, and other than that, we know very little about him. He didn't start out and write a couple of verses telling us, I am Obadiah, the son of so-and-so, a shepherd by trade. He didn't tell us any of that. He just said, hey... This is from Obadiah. And then he got right down to business. So we don't know a whole lot about him. But taken from some of the clues, we can kind of gather that it takes place uh, during the, the period of Israel and Judah's history while they were still both uh, in existence. I think around the year 800 BC, I think is what I read. Uh, so if you remember from your, your Hebrew history, uh, we had King Saul who was the first king of the nation. After King Saul, we had King David. There was a little bit of unrest during King David's time uh, with uh, Absalom uh, threatening to take away some of the kingdom. After David, his son Solomon reigned. And then after Solomon, Solomon put his son Rehoboam on the throne. Now this is where stuff really started to get heated. Because another person with the very confusingly similar name of Jeroboam came back to Israel and said, hey, I'm going to take over. And the people said to Rehoboam, hey, can you just lighten our taxes? If you do, we'll serve you forever. And he said, no, if you thought my, my father was hard, I'm going to be even worse than him. So uh, 10 of the tribes revolted and left, following with Jeroboam, the northern kingdom, also known as Israel. The southern kingdom stayed uh, with Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. That was Judah and um, Benjamin. They were also known as uh, Judah. They were collectively known as, as Judah, the kingdom of Judah. It's during this time, while they're still both in existence, that they, they have an uprising by, I believe it's the Philistines and the Amalekites. And we seem to think, based on some circumstantial evidence throughout the scriptures, that another group of people joined in this uprising called the Edomites. Now, the Edomites are very significant for us uh, tonight because that's who this book is written about, the Edomites. What's special about the Edomites is the Edomites were not natural enemies to the Hebrews. In fact, the Edomites were brothers. Back when you had Jacob and you had Esau, they both became fathers to great nations. Jacob, the father of Israel, and Esau, the father of Edom. You even had God mentioning in Deuteronomy that, you, that the Hebrews should not despise the Edomites because they are your brothers. So it should have been a special relationship, but it wasn't. The Edomites rose up and attacked uh, the, the nation of Israel. And it's because of all of this and a couple of other things that we get this book from Obadiah, a vision from God. So tonight, we're going to look at the vision of Obadiah, also known as the end result of pride. The vision of Obadiah, the end result of pride. So let's pray and then we'll get into our, our reading. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, thank you for your goodness, thank you for your love. I pray that you will give us understanding of your word as we learn about pride and how it hurts your heart. I pray that you help us to be humble before you and to come away understanding your word, being closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the vision of Obadiah, we see three parts. I'll go on and tell you the three parts, so it's not going to be a cliffhanger for you. Uh, we'll see the pride of Edom, we'll see the judgment of Edom, and we'll see the restoration of Israel. So let's start by looking at the pride of Edom. The pride of Edom is seen in verses 1 through 4, so follow along in Obadiah as I read out loud. The vision of Obadiah. 
Thus saith the Lord concerning Edom, We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent from among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. <clears throat> The pride of Edom. When God goes into detailing the pride of Edom, he starts in a very interesting way. He doesn't call them out saying, you're prideful, you need to stop. He doesn't say, this is your sin, this is what you did, this is what you did. No, he gets right to the heart of it and he says, hey guys, guess what? You're already small in my sight and in the sight of everyone around you. I think it's a very interesting way for him to uh, start because he just cuts right to the heart of their issue. And what's even more interesting about this is he says, I have made these small, or you're small now. But what we know from history is they weren't yet. They you were antagonizing Israel. But what I think is interesting is that when God makes a pronouncement on us, even though it may be years in the future, it's just as well as settled from eternity past. So God starts off describing the pride, saying, you are nothing in my sight. You are small. Then he does get into describing uh, the pride of Edom. The pride of Edom, at the, uh, at the, at the, uh, the foremost, it is uh, deceitful. Uh, he, he details this in uh, verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? So they were deceived in their heart by what they saw around them, by themselves, by their pride. They looked around them and they said, hey, we have done some pretty good stuff. The Edomites lived uh, just to the, uh, the east, or to the right of Israel, if you look on a map. So you have the, the Mediterranean Sea here, and you have Israel on the side of the sea. On their east, or their right side, is the River Jordan, and just across the River Jordan are the Edomites. They live in a mountainous region, a lot of hills, a lot of cliffs, and their city was built on the top of a, a great plateau. And on the top of this plateau, you could see the cliffs surrounding all around. There's no way to get up into the city except one path. This one path led up the, led up the mountain. And as you got up close to the city, there was a great canyon. And you had to go through this canyon to get into the city. So as you can imagine, in a time of no airplanes, no hot air balloons, no anything like that, <clears throat> Having one path through a mountain up into your city meant that you could defend your city pretty well. It was a very defensible city, and because of this, Edom looked at themselves and said, we are great, we are in the rocks, we are in the mountains, and nothing can touch us. God, however, had a different idea about this. He says in verse 4, though thou, or even if you, exalt yourself, as the eagle, and though thou set thy, thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down. It doesn't matter if you're on the top of a mountain. It doesn't matter if you rise up to the heights of an eagle. It doesn't matter if you get all the way up into the stars. God says, I will bring you down. <clears throat> I think the... The worst part of the pride of the Edomites is that when they looked around them, they were so proud of themselves and what they had done, but really they hadn't done any of it. They didn't build the mountain that they were living on. They didn't put the rocks together to form where they were. They were literally living in the middle of providence from God, and they looked at it and said, look at what we have done. And I think that is just like us sometimes. A lot of the times, you know, we look at pride as a great king sitting on his throne who looks out over the, the realm of Babylon and says, look at what I have done. 
But I think pride is a lot more subtle than that oftentimes. Because we look at ourselves and we are reliant on ourselves. I think that's how it gets us a lot of the times. We look at the job that we got. We look at the paycheck that we got because we studied in college or we spent years honing our skills. Or we look at the family that we've put together. Or we look at the house that we have and we say, look at what I did. And even if we never say those words out loud, the attitude is still in our hearts a lot of the times. Where we look at it as us providing for ourselves, I mean, that's the American dream, isn't it? Is work hard, study, make something of yourself. And by doing that, we have this reliance on ourselves. We have this pride in our hearts saying that we are sufficient for ourselves rather than keeping our focus on God and what God has provided. Because we didn't provide that house for ourselves. God provided it for us. We didn't provide that job for ourselves or that skill to be able to do that job for ourselves. God provided it for us. Our pride is deceitful when it causes us to have an incorrect view of ourselves and our surroundings. This is the pride that the Edomites had. A deceitful pride saying that they had created this amazing thing that they had. So we see first from the vision of Obadiah, the pride of the Edomites. But second, and I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone who studied uh, the, the prophets, we're gonna see the judgment of Edom. The judgment of Edom is verses 5 through 16. So follow along as I read. In verse 5, If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought out? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed, to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. <coughs> thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. The judgment of Edom. We see that this judgment, uh, we're going to see a couple of characteristics of this judgment. The first characteristics of the judgment of Edom is its severity. Its severity. The severity is, it is a total judgment. God said, if thieves came to thee by night, would they not have stolen till they had enough? 
So wouldn't it not be strange for you to go to work, someone to break into your house and take literally everything you own? I mean, they cart away the refrigerator, they cart away the stove, they cart away the couch, they even take out the trash and clean up the crumbs behind your counter. How strange would that be? Now when they come, they're coming, they're taking the electronics, they're taking the TV, they're taking the jewelry, but the gallon of milk in your refrigerator, they're probably leaving that. Not so with the judgment of Edom. When the robbers come to Edom, Edom, they're taking absolutely everything. Total and utter judgment is befalling Edom. And in case they didn't get the picture, there's another metaphor. When a farmer comes who's tending to grapevines, sometimes he's going to have grapes that fall off and he doesn't see. Sometimes he's going to have grapes that just aren't ready. Sometimes he's going to have grapes that insects got into or that just aren't never developed right, and he's going to leave them. Sometimes he's not going to see all of the grapes. So he's going to get grapes, and then he's going to leave some grapes. But when the reapers come to take judgment upon Edom, every last grape will be found. Every last treasure will be found. And in fact, God says, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things, his hidden rooms, his hidden caves, his hidden cities, how are they found out and searched out and judged? Absolutely everything of Edom receives the judgment of God. It is a total judgment. Not only is it a total judgment, the judgment of Edom, let's see the manner of judgment. The manner is the same as they did to Israel. In verse 11, in the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Remember, Edom was supposed to be a friend of Israel. They were brothers. But that's not what happened. They joined with the enemy. They attacked Israel. They captured those trying to run away from the attackers and captured them and brought them back. God says that just as you did to Israel, the same will happen to you because in verse 7, all the men of the con thy confederacy, the people you're friends with, they're going to take thee back to the border. They're going to fight at your border. They're going to defriend you. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread, or those that you've supported, that you've given things to, you didn't even realize it and they've wounded you. The manner of the judgment is going to be the exact same as what you did to Israel. So we see the severity of the judgment, we see the manner of the judgment. Uh, third, we'll see the time of the judgment. When will this judgment happen? Uh, the time is listed out in verse 15. Uh, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. The day of the Lord. Now, when is the day of the Lord? I think ultimately the day of the Lord is the end of times when God judges the, the heathens. When he comes back in all of his glory and he judges the unsaved and the wicked. I think ultimately that's the day of the Lord. But I think there's a more immediate fulfillment to it that we see. Um, in We can't see exactly when, but in Malachi 1... Um, if you can turn over there if you want to see it. Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1, we'll look verses 1 through 4. Um, Malachi 1 has an interesting uh, cross-reference in uh, the book of Romans when Paul gets into um, predestination and foreknowledge and God hating Jake, God loving Jacob and hating Esau. Interesting cross-reference. We won't have time to get into that, so we're not going to. But if you want to look into it, it's, it's interesting. So, in Malachi chapter 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob? 
And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. It sounds to me like this judgment has already happened on Edom by this point. They're gone. God has wiped them out. So the day of the Lord, sometime after Israel and Judah, sometime before the time of Christ, Edom indeed was destroyed. So the judgment of Israel, uh, sorry, the judgment of Edom, the severity, the manner, and the time. Now final, we're going to look at the justification for this judgment. The justification. Because if a judge gives an unrighteous judgment, he's not a good judge. If he has no justification and he just does whatever he feels like, he's not a good judge. If he has no justification, he's not a good judge. The justification for this judgment is that it is a fulfillment of the sinful desires that Edom had. So verse uh, 16, For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, whether that mean that they literally drank upon the mountain of God, on the temple mount, or whether just figurative, they drank in victory over the people of God, or they thought they were drinking in victory over the, the people of God, it says, Just like that, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. Now, when the heathen drink, this isn't a drink of victory. It's not a drink of a party after they vanquish their foes. It's a continuation of drinking the cup that they've been drinking all along. The cup of destruction, the cup of wickedness, the cup of sin. It's a continuation of what they've already chosen. They take it and they drink every last drop. Plainly, the destruction and the wickedness that they chose God gives them over to and allows them to see the, the natural end of their wickedness. This reminds me of uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 24 where um, Paul talks about the heathen seeing God, knowing that there is a God, knowing that they need to, to worship God. But they choose to stay in their wickedness. And in verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So be careful, because when you say, I want myself, I want my own desires, that's not what you think it means. That's not a good thing. Because if God decides to give you over to your desires, that's not a good thing. So let's go back to our idea of our jobs and our houses and our families that we have. <clears throat> and if we think that that is our, our own doing, that's our own strength and our own abilities, how scary would it be for God to say in the future, well, you know what? Go at it. Have a try at it without me. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? And it's just as scary to think that we got here where we are, all alone, without God. The justification is that God just gave them over to fulfill the sinful desires that they had in their hearts. The vision of Obadiah shows us the pride of Edom. The vision of Obadiah shows us the judgment of Edom. <clears throat> But finally, the judgment of Obadiah shows us the restoration of Israel. Um, the restoration of Israel, it's, it's an interesting idea to bring up in the end of this, this book because the whole book is about Edom and about the judgment that Edom is going to go through. So it's really interesting that God would bring up the restoration of Israel here, but it's, it makes a lot of sense when you read it. So in Obadiah, uh, let's look at verse 17. Verse 17, But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall be kindled in them, and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. 
And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. And the saviors and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. We're not going to spend long looking at the uh, restoration of Israel. But what I'd like to point out from this restoration of Israel is you notice whose land they take back? They take back the land of a lot of peoples, but the Edomites. And that shows me that though I think that I have a good plan, though I like the mountain that I'm living up in, it doesn't matter if I'm not following God's plan because God's plan right here shows us that His plan always succeeds. The plan of God always goes on and always succeeds whether we decide that we are following along or not. So, the vision of Obadiah, it shows us how a nation had pride. It shows us how Edom was judged, and it shows us how ultimately God's plan prevails and uh, Israel is restored. So think about your life. Think about your life, and what are the mountains that you're living on in your life that you're so proud of that, you, that even, even without realizing it sometimes, you think, wow, look at what I did. And remember that in, everything in our life is for God, is because of God. So I hope that we can remember the vision of Obadiah. Remember the ultimate end of pride. Let's pray.